Well, what are the former president's legal prospects then? Let's get the views of legal analyst Mpumalelo Zikalala. Mpumalelo, good evening to you and welcome. As you might have heard in that package, the Azuma's counsel arguing previously that it was Fraser's prerogative to override the decision of the Medical Parole Board by using appropriate sections of the law. How much of an argument could arise from this? Um, they, they, they could be such, but I don't think that the argument is the one that is going to make them successful. The argument which the court may look at, it may come back and say, uh, Mr. Zuma, you're an innocent applicant in this particular matter. There's nothing that you submitted which was incorrect or misleading. All that you needed to do was to receive a decision from a person who had the appropriate power to do so after he or she has followed the appropriate relevant uh, sections and also looked at the relevant provisions that enable him to do that. Now, the emphasis in the Correctional Services Act is then to say, if you are going to go and uh, grant someone medical parole, you must look at the medical report that is there. In fact, the act is very clear. It uses words such as must and shall so to, to give a clear determination that it is not only your prerogative. You have to look back and say, what does the, the medical report say? Is this person really in a bad state to such an extent that we cannot take care of that particular individual within this particular medical facility? If the answer is yes, then you have all the power now to grant this medical parole. Why do we do that? When a decision has been taken by a decision maker in South Africa, it must be lawful, meaning there must be an enabling access that allows you to do that. Most importantly, it must be rational, meaning that all the other explanations and these reasons for granting these particular applications are there. And in this case, it's the medical parole that you have report in which you are going to use as a commissioner who should then advise that this person is really one which must be granted this medical par par parole. And the last result of procedure. So if you have one element which is missing, one of rationality, it then means that your decision has not, is not one which can be taken as being rational. But we have a unique case here because we cannot then punish the former president from the mis for the mistakes of Mr. Fraser. The court may come back and say, let's look at the term of freedom. Are you really a, a person who is free or, or still incarcerated? The answer would be yes, he's been deprived of the freedom as per the definition in the, in the constitution. So to send him back to court is not going to serve anything. So we may have a situation at a later stage where the court would say, I'm letting you go, Mr. Zuma, because you were detained initially and you still are. However, I'm going to punish Mr. Fraser for, for taking a decision which is incorrect and against the provisions of the, of, of the Correctional Services Act. Okay, wow. There was so much that you said there. I mean, I'll get back to the concept of jail time, but let's stay with the concept of medical parole and what precedent could be set here in light of the fact mm. that Zuma was granted it by the former Correctional Services Commissioner, Arthur Fraser, against the recommendation of the Medical Parole Advisory Board. Mm. As the law currently stands, whose decision trumps whom? The, the, the final decision is that of the commissioner. However, the commissioner takes that particular decision after receiving a report from the, the, the medical practitioners. So the decision whether to grant or not to grant, it is solely based or heavily based on the recommendation that you've been given by the medical practitioners. From a rationality, a rationality point of view, if the doctors come back to the commissioner and say, Doctor, uh, commissioner, this person can stay in our facility, everything is fine. The question would be on what basis are you then saying that this particular individual must be released on medical parole when you have qualified experts telling you otherwise or disagreeing with the decision that you want to take at the end of the day? All right, so let's get into the other piece then, Mpumalelo. Um, before we explore the prospect of a loss for the president and this matter potentially being taken to the constitutional court, um, let's, let's look at what's at stake for the former president when it comes to a prescription of jail time if he loses his bid at the SEA. Hmm. If he loses his, his bid, they're going to say go back to prison. The, the number of, of months in which you've stayed outside of prison are not, are not to be counted or they're not going to be accounted for or taken as if you were arrested. I don't think that our courts will, will come to that particular decision to be a very peculiar one. Because if you look at the definition of being uh, detained, it basically means that your rights or your freedom is, 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 has been restricted. You can't do or go anywhere where you want to go based on what you want to do. So if you still have to ask for permission before you go to another province, for example, if, if you go to another country, for, for example, you are still detained. It's a technical definition of being detained. Number two, it's, it's the intention of the detainment. It's not necessarily that you need to be sent to prison. Not, that's not the only punishment in which we send people to prison for. 
However, it's, it's the one of saying that you want to restrict, you are not, you are not going to be allowed to use your, your liberties as you so wish. In this case, the former president cannot do as he pleases. For example, I always use this example. He cannot go to Dubai tomorrow and say, I want to go on holiday because he's still detained and he's still being regarded as a prisoner. So if at the end of the day, the intention of sending him to jail or the intention of the punishment was to deprive him of his freedom, that is still being achieved and has been achieved for the previous months. So if we send him to jail and say that we are not going to consider all these months in which we have spent outside, definitely it's going to be double punishment from my perspective. And it's not going to be in the interest of justice that we do that particular uh, process. Particularly if you, you know, if, if it follows, as you say, that specifically as an individual and as a client, uh, he didn't have power, the power of control over the, de the decisions made both by the Medical Parole Board and by Arthur Fraser. So, so in a sense, he, he is a casualty of the legal process? De de definitely. He, in, in fact, he, he's an innocent applicant. All he did was to submit an application. The mere fact that the handling and the assessment of that application was somewhat wrong or somewhat correct, depending on how you look at it, should not have a bearing on him. And, and so that he is the one who's been punished for that. Mm. Let's punish the wrongdoers in this case. The wrongdoers are the decision makers. And, and in this case, they are saying that it's Mr. It's, it's, it's Mr. Fraser. So we cannot punish Zuma or the former president Zuma for that. Let's punish the correct individual because at the end of the day, he didn't say, I'm releasing myself and granting me this medical parole. He submitted an application. An application was assessed. And he was given a yes answer at the end of the day. I mean, that's so interesting because I, I wonder then if this would not have provided um, uh, Mr. Zuma's legal team with an elegant way out of, you know, all the complicated legal terrain that they must now, you know, kind of navigate and just say that in, uh, you know, as we've just been discussing, that he is a, a legal casualty. I, I, I think that should have been one of the strategies in terms of saying, if I can't win based on the technicalities, how one should interpret the act, let me look at, at my client as an individual. At the end of the day, the principles of injustice will then have to come in as to say who is exactly the wrongdoer in this particular case. Rather than dealing with the correctness or, or, or the incorrectness of the decision, let me look at the implications. Let me go further and, 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 and describe what does it mean to be incarcerated? What mm. does it mean to be called a prisoner? What, what are the implications of such? It may be that I'm outside, outside of the prison gates However, I'm still a prisoner outside, where even, even when I'm home. So if the achievement or the, the sole goal was to punish me so that I'm deprived of my liberties as the former president or as a, the, a detained individual, I'm still detained even now. So rather, let me elaborate on that and say, in the application which is being seeked by the, the, the I think it's the Democratic Alliance, if I'm not mistaken, in this matter. But in that particular application, let me stand my ground and say, don't punish me twice. I've already been punished before. I can't be punished for a mistake which was caused by somebody else. All right. So then let's come to, you know, whether they, they I mean, first of all, it will be interesting to see how the SCA deals with it, um, you know, if that, if that ever comes up as a factor in his defense or to bolster his case. But let's come then to a potential censure if somebody had overstepped in terms of the law. What could that possibly be? Or is the only room, the only scope for any kind of impact or change, uh, a change in law in terms of um, those responsibilities of who holds the ultimate decision? It, it, it could be just a change in law, maybe a few amendments of, of making sure that they tidy up the Correctional Services Act to make sure that it is very clear as to who the final decision maker is and what is dependent on, on him or her when they are taking that final decision. Right. However, in getting what maybe they would have drafted in their papers or the seek order, I don't think they're going to be, to, they're going to be able to achieve this. This matter has simply turned into a matter of principle, has turned into a matter of making sure that the president has said that you can't really overrule the powers of, of, of the recommendation of the medical parole board without a, a second or a competing interest or a competing advisory board report, which goes against the, the medical report that you have in your possession. Other than that, I don't think it's going to achieve anything else. It's just simply two individuals going to court and trying to reverse. But basically, the horse is bolted. There's nothing that you can do. At the end of the day, it's going to be a matter of principle in making sure that we are amending the law to prevent these type of occurrences uh, from, 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 from happening again. However, it, it has been the case when it came to Correctional Services Act and the manner in which, especially 
parole is dealt with. What comes to mind is the, the, the case of Mr. Shabir Sheikh, similar to what is happening now, and all the amendments that you've seen taking place within this particular act are due to all the inefficiencies or the loopholes which were then opened by the previous act. So we may see this particular act uh, dealing directly with the future amendments that will be able to close those loopholes and to make sure that you hold the Commissioner of Correctional Services accountable. Thank you so much, Mpumalelo um, Zikalala. Really appreciate your uh, insight and your analysis there. We'll certainly see what happens um, as these legal proceedings kick off in the week ahead.